I tried not to let my irritation show on my face. It is often difficult to maintain a professional, detached demeanor with new patients. This is especially true when dealing with people like Katrina. Yes, you heard right. Katrina. That's the devastating hurricane that practically wiped out New Orleans. Ironic that she had a name like that, considering what I was beginning to realize about her. She was definitely a force to be reckoned with, and that was still putting it mildly. However, her demeanor was completely at odds with her refined feminine appearance. Her nonverbal communication was arrogant and aggressive. Her eyes looked directly at me when she spoke, as if challenging me. She sat in the center of the couch, which in itself was unusual. Most people who get the whole couch usually choose either side with an armrest, but Katrina sat down on the center cushion, as if taking possession of it. Putting one leg over the other, arms crossed in her lap, with a condescending smirk on her face, she sat as if she were ready for battle. I think men would call her an ice queen. Others, less tactful, would say bitch queen. It is very common for new patients to feel on edge and nervous. Some feel they have to like the therapist, or at least not think badly of him or her. Others want some kind of validation that they were right to do what they did, or were innocent victims of what happened to them. It makes them defensive. People like Kat compensate by showing bravado. Katrina, however, was a little different. Her hostility seemed to be rooted in an inner anger. At the moment, it was directed at her ex-husband. Misdirected was a more appropriate word. One of the most important things I've learned is this. People rarely get angry at what they direct their rage at. It's like a toothache. Sometimes the pain is felt in the wrong tooth. They call it reflected pain. And in my line of work, anger works the same way. So Katrina, call me Cat Doc. We've talked about this before. I try to control the flow of the conversation. She insists I call her by her first name, but then calls me Doc instead of Beth or Dr. Carter. She wants me to know that everything is in her hands. Let her have it. For now. I'm sorry. Cat, you had your first session with me last week. We learned a lot about each other, but we didn't touch on what exactly brought you here. Since you've scheduled and come in for a second session, I'm assuming you want to start digging a little deeper. So why don't we start with why you're here? I noticed her tapping her foot nervously on the floor, which gave away the controlled image she wanted to convey. However, she defiantly rolled her eyes and groaned as if she was annoyed. I'm here because my ex-husband is a wimp. Colorful language for a Stanford-educated woman. She's exaggerating. She's trying to take me out of my comfort zone by being extreme. Okay, Kat. Tell me, what do you mean when you say he's a wimp? I noted the brief look of surprise that flashed across her face. I wanted to show her that her antics didn't scare me in the least. Well, Doc, Bran is a wimp because when we got married, he had no pride, no fight. Her smirk let me know it was intentional. As funny as it is, you never answered the question, I said in an even tone. There was nothing but professionalism on my face, as if I was completely unfazed by her blatant attempt to steer the train away from its destination. Seeing the silent confirmation on her part, I added, But I think you know that, Cat." She was testing the balance of power in our relationship. After all, she was a lawyer. I expected a lot from her. My goal was to show her that this was not a power struggle and certainly not an adversarial hearing. She didn't need to have the upper hand. I wasn't here to change her mind. My job was to help her figure out what had brought her here. Why don't you start by telling me about what upsets you about your ex, I said invitingly. Something resembling sadness flashed across her face. She seemed determined not to show any emotion, so it passed quickly. First of all, he never fought for anything. Every argument ended with him just leaving the room. He didn't even yell back. He would tell me we weren't in a courtroom, and I shouldn't beat him up like a hostile witness. Then she said mockingly, He's never seen me question a hostile witness. If he had, he would have realized he got off easy. Her tone was full of anger and sarcasm, but something more was heard in it. Regret, sadness, maybe even a little remorse. What do you think he should have done when you two fought? 
her face contorted with a mixture of emotions. I don't know. Wrestle. Yell. Anything. Is that what you think real men do in an argument? Fight and argue? She threw me a look that then turned into a smirk. I see what you're doing, Doc. Next you're going to tell me Bran was right not to argue. She's trying to anticipate what I'm going to say in response. It helps her keep her cool. Actually, Kat, I was going to agree with you, but for different reasons. Fighting isn't what real men do, but it's what all people do when they're passionate about something. They fight to protect what they care about. People often think that the perfect relationship is one where there are no disagreements, no fights. In fact, it is quite the opposite. If there are two people who never argue about anything, it can only mean one of three things. The first is that one or both people in the relationship are not being completely honest about what is bothering them. They are just agreeing for the sake of peace. Two, one or both people don't care enough about the relationship to waste energy fighting. Three, one of the people in the relationship is oppressed into complete submission. The look of surprise on her face told me I had caught her off guard. She struggled to pick up on her answer. I didn't want to turn this into an altercation, so I changed course. Tell me, what made you fall in love with Brandon to begin with? It took her a couple seconds to realize the new direction. She raised her eyes to the ceiling and pressed her lips together, as if pondering. Without noticing it herself, her frown softened slightly, and her lips curled into a smile. Almost. Bran was... kind. Kindest person I've ever known. And he was patient with me. He didn't call me bossy like so many other men in my life. He appreciated my responsible nature. How did you two communicate with each other? She laughed slightly at the thought of it. It wasn't a sarcastic laugh like before. It was more of a reminiscent one. Brandon didn't have a problem communicating. We could talk about anything for hours. The smile slowly left her face, and her voice broke when she said, At least at first. What did you two talk about when things were good? I asked, trying to bring her back to happier memories. It was probably a little selfish of me, but I liked seeing the lack of a wistful expression on her face. Everything. Movies, people, politics, my job. It doesn't matter. Even if he didn't know what he was talking about, he could talk about it. She grinned. There was never a dull moment with him. Why do you think he fell in love with you? I asked. I realized too late that it was a mistake. The smirk returned to her face as her eyes stared at mine again with defiance. Because I was having so much fun that he realized it couldn't get any better. Plus, I took care of his lazy ass. If it wasn't for me, he'd be another broke writer who can't feed himself. I silently reprimanded myself. I unwittingly let her retreat into her aggressive, condescending wall. However, I noticed something that might have been helpful. She tried to dodge the question with sarcasm because she probably can't think of an answer to that question. I decided to give her a little nudge. So, you fell in love with him because he was smart, funny, kind, patient, and appreciated you for who you were. And he only fell in love with you because you were good in bed and paid the bills? Is that how you view your relationship? I paused to let him comprehend what I'd said before I proceeded to shock him again. It sounds like you got a better deal out of the marriage. She looked at me incredulously and asked, How did you figure that out? Well, if what you say is true, then you fell in love with a man who was patient with you and loved you for who you were. You could talk to him about things that interested you. But all he got was a sweet mommy who lays down well. That made her come to her senses a little. It made her think about the real answer. The smirk disappeared. I guess he liked my openness. He told me he liked my brutal honesty because he always knew where he stood. I didn't play word games or try to spare his feelings. I said what I meant. Her face frowned. I also noticed she hesitated when she said, brutal honesty. I focused on that. Have you always been honest with him? She looked at the floor. A very important moment, because I felt like this was the real beginning for us. Yes, I have, even when it hurt. She said it in a much softer voice than usual. When did you hurt him, Cat? 
I could see the walls crumbling. My intuition told me it was too good to be true. It was too fast. I hit the mark because Katrina jerked back. Instantly, she retreated to her safe place, behind which her implacable lawyer lurked. Who gives a shit? We're already divorced, so there's no point in talking about it. She crossed her arms defiantly and stared at me. She resembled a small child who had been told he or she had to apologize to a sibling. Well, obviously you care. If you didn't, you wouldn't be here. I saw signs that she was struggling with the tsunami of emotions that threatened to crash over her. Her eyes were watery with unshed tears as she looked away. She avoided all eye contact with me. Why don't you tell me about how you hurt Brandon? I said in a comforting but commanding tone. Then I let the air fill with silence. Katrina left my question unanswered. She wanted to wait for me to force a change of subject. But I had the advantage. Even in her silence, I could read body language that spoke louder than she could scream at the full power of her lungs. She wanted to tell me about this. She needed to. These held back feelings were screaming to be heard. They were hiding beneath the surface and fighting her need to hold herself together to break free. I knew that once she realized that this wasn't a power struggle, she would relent and open up. Okay, fine, she said finally. I was honest with him when I was having fun with another man. I told him about it, and then I divorced him. Are you happy now? She searched my face for any reaction, but I didn't say anything back. I remained neutral. It was important for her to see that nothing she said could shock me. It would help her feel comfortable. Describe him, I said nonchalantly. Who, Terry? She asked. Of course I meant Terry. She knew that. It was a time-dragging tactic. Yes, I'd like to hear about Terry. What attracted you to him? Katrina took a deep breath and raised her eyes to the ceiling again. This time, the smile was more prominent on her face than when she was talking about her husband. Terry is... was... a co-worker. He's a lawyer, too. She paused, remembering. God, that man just owns the courtroom. He can make the judge and opposing counsel eat out of his hands. He's got this swagger about him. It's like he knows that no matter what, he's going to get his way. He has a commanding presence, said I. It wasn't a question. I rephrased her words to give them more context. She nodded. Oh yes, he's the only person who's ever intimidated me. We were both vying for the title of senior partner. I see. That's intimidation you felt. Did it attract you? Caused you to fall for it? I think so, yes. It was quite exciting. No man has ever made me feel that way, including Bran. She leaned forward and began to run her fingers over her fingers. All the men I've dated have always been inferior to me. A few of my ex-boyfriends ate vegan only because I told them that as long as they were with me, they wouldn't eat meat. Even if they didn't like it, they ate it for me. Bran didn't go that far, but he was pretty much in line with the others. Terry wasn't like that. He was more like me. He didn't get in line. He started it. Nothing could get in the way of what he wanted to do. He could get people to follow him simply because he told them to. I loved Brandon, I really did. But sometimes, just sometimes, I wished he was the same. You know? I understand, I said, making a few notes. Did you see more of a man in Terry than you did in Brandon? She thought for a few seconds. I wouldn't say that. What would you say? And I could see the wheels of thought spinning in her head. Terry was more, I don't know, imposing, I guess. Powerful. It drew me in. And those were the qualities you felt Brandon lacked? Yes. I took a few more notes. Okay, Kat. Let's switch gears. Tell me the story. I want to hear about the first time you crossed the line with Terry. Her eyebrows furrowed in confusion. Cross the line? What do you mean? I smiled to myself. I had deliberately used the open-ended statement, crossed the line, instead of specifically saying, cheated on my husband. Most people associate cheating with a physical act. That's how they justify all the little things that lead up to it. Flirting 
sexual innuendo, etc. It all seems innocent in comparison. The fact that she asked me to elaborate means that part of her knew that even those little things could be considered inappropriate. I want you to tell me anything that comes into your head. Don't think about it too hard. Whatever comes into your head, go along with it. Start talking before your internal filter goes off. She thought about it some more, then said, Okay, I think the first time will be the most successful. Good. Tell me about the bet. Cat, five years ago. I leaned back in my chair and rolled my eyes when there was an annoying noise in the air. Oh, Phil, I said in an amused voice, interrupting the noise. I love how you try to talk tough, like you actually have a case. It would be adorable if it wasn't so annoying. But okay. We both know you have nothing to fall back on. He launched into another puffed-up monologue about laws and bylaws, none of which helped his position one bit. All he did was fill the dead air with loud words that were meant to inspire fear. As if on cue, the paralegal I had been waiting for brought me the actual bylaws pertaining to the case, not some made-up one that might have applied in 1995. I pointed to the phone to indicate that this was the conversation I needed her for. She smiled quietly as she opened the manila folder and tapped her finger on the highlighted section. Cat, my client wants... began Phil speaking, his annoying voice coming through the speakerphone. I didn't care at all what his client wanted, so I interrupted him. Phil, please stop talking. Your voice is annoying and my stomach hurts from being fed too much nonsense. Apparently your paralegals aren't worth a damn. Fortunately, ours are top-notch so I took the liberty of asking them to do your work for you. Having said that, I winked playfully at the paralegal who was handing me the papers. She smiled broadly at my praise. I'm going to email you some bylaws that should interest you. Please read them. As much as I love embarrassing you in court, it gets tiresome. How many times have you lost against me already? The line fell silent for the first time since he had called me with his client's demands. Then he said bitterly, you're a real bitch, Cat. Yes, that's right. Three times. I could feel him seething on the other end of the wire. Screw you. Understand. Screw you. He growled, showing off his extensive Columbia University education. Will do, Phil. Kiss my wife for me. Ta-ta. I muttered with fake cheerfulness as I hung up the phone. I then closed the manila folder in front of me and scribbled a few instructions on the front of it. Sonia, give this to Kim and tell her to email it to these people. And close the door behind you, please. Nodding, Sonia took the folder and walked out. I exhaled noisily and leaned back in my chair, enjoying the silence. Glancing at the clock, I realized it was only 10.30 in the morning. Brandon must have gotten out of bed by now. It's so nice to be able to wake up whenever I want. People with real jobs don't have that luxury. I decided to take a moment and make a call to check on him. I pulled out my cell phone and found his number on my favorites list. Hi, kitty cat, he said, picking up after the third ring. Hey, babe, how was your day? I asked in a machine-like manner. I didn't really listen to the answer because I knew exactly what he was going to say. We had this conversation in one form or another almost every day. At this point, he would tell me either about a publisher that had rejected his book a publisher he was still waiting to hear back from, or a new publisher he was going to talk to. Every now and then he would tell me about a new story he was writing, which in turn will be rejected in the future. While I was talking to him, my cell phone buzzed in my office, indicating that my secretary was trying to reach me. I muted my cell phone and pressed the button to talk to her. Brandon still kept talking, and I knew I had a few minutes before I had to answer. Like I said, we talked about this on a daily basis. Yes, Kim. Mr. Ross is here to see you. I smiled to myself and rolled my eyes. Terry. Of course he was here. No doubt the reason for his visit was to gloat and stroke my face with the fact that he had won our little bet. We had a whale we were both trying to catch on a fishing line named Mr. Wellington. This guy was a lawyer's dream. He was a walking lawsuit and he was a VIP of a Fortune 500 company. 
He had so many billable hours that he probably would have saved a fortune by opening a law firm and devoting it to his cases. You'd think his company would have stuck with that kind of responsibility, but he was bringing them money. It was not in their best interest to let him go, but to continue to represent him properly. Terry and I pursued this guy relentlessly. We both realized that by getting him, we could become senior partner. The competition became so intense that Terry proposed a wager. The loser was to make the winner coffee every day for a month, whenever the winner wanted it. Whether it was a board meeting or just a meeting with a client, the loser had to suffer the humiliation of stopping all their business and going for coffee. I thought I had the upper hand in this battle. Since many of Mr. Wellington's cases involved inappropriate behavior with women, I strategically decided it was in his best interest to have a female face handle his defense. I looked good on camera and people often responded well to me, so my presence would really help his PR. What I hadn't counted on was that Mr. Wellington would be so forthright. His ego drove him to not even hide it. When I first met him and his wife, I wondered how she had any brain cells left after all that snorting. Within an hour of meeting him, I realized it was the only way she could stand to be married to him. I knew I was in for an uphill battle with him when he kept calling me honey buns and sweet cakes. He was a fat bastard, but he wasn't referring to his addiction to sweets. Later, Terry jokingly told me to be grateful that he didn't call me meat in my blouse, like he did to a former employee who was currently suing him. In short, Terry won both the client and the argument. I hated losing, but was glad I didn't have to defend this misogynistic asshole all the time. I was a lawyer, and a damn good one, but I was also a woman. Hey, 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 Bran, I said quickly, trying to break through his memorized script to get his attention. Let me call you back. I have a customer coming in. Okay. It was a little white lie. I didn't even have to say it. It was just easier for me to say that I had a client coming to see me and not another lawyer. It was business related anyway. Kind of like. Okay, kitty cat. I'll see you tonight. Love you. Love you too. Bye. I said hastily, disconnecting. Then I pressed the button on my office phone again and said, send him in. A few seconds later, Terry walked in and closed the door behind him. I watched as he took a seat in front of my desk with a confident grin and crossed his legs, resting his ankle on his knee. What can I do for you, Terry? I asked in an indifferent tone, as if he was annoyed with me. He chuckled and rubbed his chin. Coffee light, two hazelnut creams, three packets of Splenda. Splenda? Are you watching your girly figure? No. Stephanie just likes it that way. I decided to get the secretary a cup for a change. You know, to show my appreciation. It's the least I can do. He said this with a smugness masquerading as genuine disinterest. Your favor knows no bounds, I said dryly, rolling my eyes and stood up. I walked to my door to leave the office. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed he was watching me the whole way out. Terry and I often exchanged barbs in the office. We'd often exchange barbed phrases, scolding each other. But everyone knows that when two people have a quip at each other, it's just a thin veil for flirting. Underneath it all, there was mutual respect as well as physical attraction. I stopped at my door and turned around. You're not going to put me through that ridiculous bed, are you? He chuckled again. You know, Cat. I hear what you're saying, but I'm still short on caffeine. How about we fix that? He finished the sentence with an exaggerated wink and a click of his teeth. I groaned loudly. Great, I'll be right back, I said through clenched teeth. As I was walking out, I heard him playfully shout at me. Have some courage, blouse meat. I wagged my finger over his shoulder in response. I seriously considered slipping something in his coffee. Maybe some malox or something. I gave in in the name of good sportsmanship, but it was very difficult. Instead, I handed him back his coffee as per his requirements. Enjoy, I said cryptically, holding out the coffee to him. I sat back down at my desk and smirked, looking at him, daring him to take a drink. I was trying to piss him off. I hadn't put anything in his cup, but he didn't know that. 
He eyed me suspiciously for a while, then took a hesitant sip. When he realized the drink didn't contain poison, he looked at me again with that damn smirk. Wow, counselor. I must say you make a really good cup of joe. We should have made this bet a long time ago. Stephanie is going to love it. Eat me, I said without thinking about it. The moment threatened to get awkward, but Terry played it off masterfully. Such unfeminine language. Do you kiss your husband with that mouth? He said, dodging the rising tension. I was a little disappointed that he didn't respond with a volley. Most men wouldn't have missed such an opportunity to flirt. This time, I deliberately took it to the next level. I leaned forward, gave him a smoldering look and said, You'd be surprised to know what I can do with my mouth. That got his attention. He looked at me curiously, trying to figure out if that's what I said. When I didn't look embarrassed, he replied, Honestly, Kat, I wouldn't be surprised by anything from you. You're a woman of many talents. My ego was stroked, and I doused him with cold water to cool him down. Good. You may now leave my office and hand your secretary my perfect coffee. The quick change in temperature knocked him out of it for a second. Then he laughed, rising from his chair. You can be a bitch sometimes. You know about that? I've heard, I said, winking at him and snapping just as he did to me. He shook his head with a final chuckle and headed for my door. He was about to walk out but stopped. He turned around and looked at me with a twinkle in his eyes. What if I give you another way to pay your bet? Curious, I leaned back in my chair. I'm listening. He thought for a second, as if trying to decide whether to say what he was thinking. Then he asked slyly, What kind of underwear are you wearing? This time, it was my turn to get whiplash from the sudden sharp turn this conversation had taken. Excuse me? incredulously exclaimed I. What incomprehensible thing had I said? My mouth dropped open. You're kidding, right? He said nothing. Didn't apologize didn't try to excuse himself. He just stood there, as if seriously expecting me to answer. Uh, it's none of your damn business. That's just the way it is, I finally said. He smirked and let out a small chuckle, like he knew something I didn't. Okay. Okay. He raised his hands in a sign of surrender. But, if you go and send me the picture, I might be able to convince you to go back to making Stephanie make her own coffee. He then backed away toward the door, leaving me puzzled. You're crazy, said I. I noticed that there wasn't a hint of amusement or anger in my voice. It sounded more like amusement. Just a thought, he said, finally opening the door and leaving. I sat in my empty office and shook my head. This man had a lot of nerve. He was married, for crying out loud. I had met Christina on more than one occasion. He was also acquainted with my husband. Neither of those things had stopped him from making his absurd request. And yet I couldn't help but be struck by his audacity. I should have been more offended, but I wasn't. Surprisingly, I was a little flattered. Terry seemed attractive to me. Any woman who wasn't a full-blown lesbian would have found it. He was handsome, driven, successful, he always smelled nice, and he could talk. It makes a man feel good to know that someone he finds attractive feels the same way. I thought about his offer. What should have been an immediate hell no turned into an argument between me and my conscience. After all, he hadn't asked me to entertain him. I grabbed my phone and sent him a quick text. Do you have Instagram? A few minutes later, he replied with a link. I checked it and saw that it was his account. I can't believe I'm actually going to do this, thought I as I walked out of the office and headed to the ladies' room. Dr. Carter, present tense. Katrina sat on the couch with a pensive look, having finished her story. Hearing the story told in her own voice seemed to keep her in suspense. Undoubtedly, she had filed the event away in the back of her mind as insignificant. It had nothing to do with the outcome of her marriage. It was an entirely separate event. At least, that's what she'd probably been telling herself until now. So, Kat... You sent him those provocative pictures of yours. I assume he liked them. 
her contemplative look turned into a confident smile. Of course he liked them. He's a damn man. I find it interesting that you've allowed yourself to be relegated to the level of a sexual object. You strike me as someone who has fought long and hard to be treated just the opposite. The smile left her face as she thought for a moment. That's the thing, Dr. Carter. I didn't see Terry treating me as an object. Say, I turned my attention to the fact that she finally called me Dr. Carter. By this time, her wall had almost completely collapsed. That hard, tough-as-nails, cynical woman who had entered the office was gone, at least for the moment. Her entire personality had changed. She'd allowed herself to be vulnerable with me. I can see that. I nodded. I didn't completely agree with her, but I understood what she was getting at. And you like the attention? Every woman wants to be desired. And Brandon? Didn't he make you feel wanted? And she took a deep breath and moved her hair out of her face. It was different with Brandon. He used to call me beautiful all the time. So what changed Terry so much? I don't know, she said, with disappointment in her voice. We sat in silence for a while, as if taking a short break. Kat stared blankly into space, her thoughts darting around for answers. Did you see Brandon as an equal to yourself? Of course, she replied nonchalantly. He was my husband. Being a husband doesn't mean you're an equal. Earlier you called Brandon a less worthy man. I did not say that. She interrupted sharply. I was a little surprised at the vehemence with which she did so. It seemed inappropriate. You've said several times that you wished he'd become a man. That's just a saying, Doc. I didn't actually call him less of a man. She replied as soon as the words were off my lips. Her tone was argumentative. Well, I was back to being a doc. She doesn't like the thought of undermining Brandon. Odd, considering her attitude toward him. Cat, I think the term you used to describe him is wimpy, she said. Yes, well, I, I, she stammered incoherently. When she couldn't come up with a rebuttal, a look of defeat appeared on her face. Her eyes began to water. What did you mean when you called him those names? I asked after a moment's silence. I... I don't know, she said as one of the tears rolled down her cheek. I guess Trina was right. I did humiliate him. But I wasn't trying to. I just wanted him to be motivated. What did you want Brandon to be motivated to do? I don't know. Something? Anything. He had so much potential. He was just wasting it waiting for the right person to read his short stories. Do you know how hurt and embarrassed I felt? Now we're beginning to understand. Embarrassed? Yes, embarrassing, she said. Here I was a successful, cool lawyer. At work, I was a shark. People looked up to me. People were afraid of me. My co-workers respected me. I fought every obstacle people put in front of me like Rocky goddamn Balboa. And then they'd ask me what my husband was doing. She paused and let out a small, cynical chuckle. I'd answer them that he was a writer. Then they'd say, uh-oh, a writer. What has he written? And do you know what I'd have to tell them? Nothing. I finished her sentence for her, sympathy filling my voice. I knew I should have let her talk, but sympathy took over. Honestly, I could feel her frustration. I was a successful therapist. I had written several books myself and was highly respected. My husband owned his own carpentry business, which was very successful. He started it in a garage with his best friend. He now had three different offices around the state. He was discussing with his accountant the possibility of opening a fourth. When people would ask me what he did for a living, I would proudly tell them about it. I like to brag about it. Most women like to brag about their husband's accomplishments. Even successful women like to brag about their men. Kat nodded her head sadly. Yeah, it's nothing. It's like he was my stay-at-home wife. We didn't have kids, so I couldn't even use the stay-home daddy argument. After a while, I just avoided any conversations where people might ask about him. Trina doesn't understand this. Her husband is a bodybuilder and fitness trainer. She can be proud of him. Hell, 
All she has to do is show a picture of him shirtless, and people will absolutely not care what he does for a living. Trina? I asked. Kat looked confused for a second, and I said, You've already mentioned a person named Trina twice, as if I should know who she is, but... A light bulb went on in her head. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Dr. Carter. Trina is one of my best friends. We went to Stanford Law School together. She works in the DA's office now. We're both named Katrina. People used to confuse us all the time, so we asked everyone to call me Kat, since she mostly addressed Trina. I see. I see, I said. For some reason, there was something familiar about a woman named Trina working for the DA, but there was no way I could catch it. Since you brought up your husband's flaws, I was wondering why you married him in the first place. What attracted you to him? A rare smile reappeared on her face. Brandon was sweet and caring. He was the kind of person who drives to the store at three in the morning to get ice cream just because I can't sleep. Yeah, and how was the sex life? Her smile became token. Bran was pretty damn good. She laughed and nodded. He was very skillful with his mouth, and he was a good conversationalist. We both laughed at her joke. It was nice to see her reminiscing about the good times she had with her ex. It would help her not to put all the blame on him for ruining their marriage. So, your problems with him stemmed from the dissatisfaction you felt because of his lack of ambition. You wanted him to be successful at something like you were. It wasn't so much about his job. I was earning enough to support both of us. I just wanted to be proud of him, you know? Men think their wives are supposed to be proud to call them husband, even if they don't do a damn thing. We're supposed to swoon and fawn before them, no matter how much or how little they do. Well, yes and no. I paused to gather my thoughts. I had one more way to present this to her, and I was trying to decide the best way to do it. Do you mind if I give my point of view on this? Not at all, Dr. Carter. That's what I'm paying you for. Touching. You work hard to stay attractive, don't you? Yes, I do. Good. How would you feel if your husband was embarrassed by the way you looked? What if, because of his dissatisfaction with your appearance, he was embarrassed to show people pictures of you or mention you in conversation? Would that have been hurtful? Of course it would. I don't see the correlation. Well, you do expect your husband to be proud to call you his wife, right? Even if you were a 250-pound woman working at Walmart, wouldn't you expect him to be happy that you are his wife? Would you justify cheating on him because you weren't pretty enough? Those are completely different things, Dr. Carter. It's apples and oranges. No, cat. it's apples and apples. We women often subconsciously judge our potential life partners by how confident they are. In prehistoric times, men were required to be able to hunt, build a house, or build a fire. Nowadays, we judge that security by how important their career is. A higher-paying job usually means it is more important. In today's society, women are taking their lives into their own hands and seeking these jobs rather than relying on men. However, when choosing a mate, we tend to still look for a man whose job title is equivalent or higher than ours. We want to have our cake and eat it too. Intellectually, we should realize that if we are at the top of our profession, our significant other often won't be, but we're still made to expect it. Okay, she said, waiting for me to connect the dots. Well, men usually have a more primitive criterion, physical beauty. The more beautiful a wife is, the more she is honored by others who look at the marriage from the outside. In prehistoric times, a woman's physical body determined how capable she was of bearing and raising children. Men were still men. We both laughed a little before continuing. Of course, there are other factors that influence a couple's choice. Modern society has changed a lot of the way we look at things. But if we're being honest, those are the first things men and women look for in each other. Still don't see where you're going with this, Doc. Well, you could make the argument that being embarrassed by your husband's lack of ambition is almost equivalent to him being embarrassed by your looks. She looked at me thoughtfully for a moment. Then she made a grimace and said, No. No offense, Dr. Carter, but I don't agree with you at all. Good. 
agree to disagree. Be that as it may, your dissatisfaction with your husband caused you to cheat on him. No matter what perspective you look at it from, you still dealt your marriage a huge blow, one that you have not been able to recover from. But, no, Cat, it was you who did it, not him. You. I did, she said quietly as the tears began to flow. I did. She put her head in her lap and began to cry loudly. Her shoulders shook and her body shook with sobs. I sat in silence, letting my emotions overwhelm her. She needed this. As much pain as she was in, she needed this. I didn't mean to hurt him, Dr. Carter. I really didn't. I was just so disappointed in him that I couldn't even look at him the same way. But I never wanted to hurt him. I know, Cat. I said comfortingly, holding out a napkin to her. But you have to accept that you hurt him. You have to accept it. It's easy to write it off as him being a wimp. When you do that, you justify yourself by saying he deserved it. But no matter what, you can't hold him accountable for your choices. You made your own choice by cheating on him and distancing yourself from him. You may have tried to motivate him in the beginning, but somewhere along the line you gave up on him. Admit it. I don't want to, Dr. Carter. I don't want to be that person. I felt it was time to get her talking again. I didn't want this to turn into a student-teacher session where she listened obediently while I spoke. She seemed to be suffocating in this conversation. Tell me, Kat, how has your attraction to Terry affected your life at home? How have things escalated? Kat snorted and took a deep breath. Well, Kat, my life changed slowly. Slowly, 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 and then bam, nothing was ever the same. At the office, I expected there to be awkwardness between Terry and me. Surprisingly, it didn't happen. There was an initial shyness at first. The reason wasn't so much the picture I had sent him. After all, he had only seen my bra. It was the fact that I wasn't sure what he thought, what he expected. I was drawn to him, but I didn't want to have an affair. But when I saw him, he pretended like nothing had happened. There was no awkward attempts at conversation. He just jumped on me like he always did. I did the same thing, and things continued as they always do. That's not to say there wasn't a spark. We still flirted with each other when no one was looking. During meetings, I would catch his gaze lingering on me. Then he would smile a knowing smile when he saw me noticing him. To compensate, our competitiveness increased. I didn't hesitate to poach clients from him whenever the opportunity arose. I would even steal Mr. Wellington from him if I had the opportunity. We still competed with each other for the title of senior partner. Underneath it all, however, lurked our primal desires. Anticipation. I relished the fact that his eyes scanned my body from head to toe at every opportunity. I pretended not to notice anything just as he pretended not to notice me inhaling the subtle scent of his cologne. But we didn't take the next step. For one thing, I was still happily married. Mostly. Brandon was an unmotivated dreamer, wasting his potential, waiting for the right person to read his novels. But he was still my lover. I wasn't sure Terry showed the same restraint I did. He and his secretary seemed to be feeling, shall we say, a little too comfortable. They tried to pretend and appear professional when others were around, but there was something about their communication that set the rumor mill in motion. A certain familiarity that seemed a little less than professionally appropriate. Believe it or not, office romances were commonplace in our office. No one blinked an eye, even if the people were married. We spent more time in the office than we did at home. Spouses don't realize the stress and workload that lawyers have to deal with. Late nights, early morning meetings, fast-paced hustle and bustle. All of these things take their toll. Often, spouses may inadvertently add to this stress. They complain about you not being home and how lonely they feel. At the same time, they spend your money and drive luxury cars that you, of course, paid for. The only people who understand them are those with similar professions. So it's only natural to find comfort in an office where we all get it. Another reason I think Terry and I didn't pamper ourselves at that time was the rivalry that existed between us. We both wanted to get the upper hand on each other, 
so neither of us could take the next step. I certainly wasn't going to go after him. How desperate would a married woman look pursuing another man, especially if he couldn't do anything for her that she couldn't do for herself? No matter what you say, society stigmatizes male adulterers and female adulterers differently. A married man pursuing a woman is an unreliable dog, and a married woman pursuing a man is a desperate and needy bitch, and an unreliable one at that. I was neither. So I suppressed my illicit desire and satisfied myself with flirting at arm's length. Terry seemed content to do the same. And so it went on for about a year. By this time, I was staying late at work almost every night. Brandon was getting more and more annoyed with me. No matter what I said or did, he didn't want to get up and do what he needed to do. He was so complacent that it annoyed me. It got to the point where I stopped feeling desire for him and didn't want to be around him. The most frustrating thing was that he thought he was doing everything he could to get his books published, so he didn't see the logic. My reasoning was that either he was lazy and not doing everything he could, or his books really weren't that good and no amount of effort would help him realize his dreams. Either way, I felt he needed to take the bait and do something else. Maybe take up writing on the side. But he was committed to this fantasy. So he put all his eggs in one basket, and that repulsed me. Disliking Brandon made him less physically attractive to me. Does that make sense? After all, nothing had changed in his body. He was still doing the same things he'd always done. But something was missing, at least for me. One night when I often stayed up late, Brandon's situation didn't stop my body's natural urges. All it did was cause me frustration. I was used to suppressing that feeling, but it wouldn't go away. It was just simmering. On this night, it wasn't just boiling, it was bubbling. Suddenly there was a knock at the door of my room. Come in, shouted I, remembering that my assistant had gone home for the day. The door opened and Terry walked in. I thought I saw your car in the parking lot, he said. Don't you ever drive home? Well, there must be at least one lawyer here to fill in for you. The only time I see you working is when you're pretending to be a lawyer to poach my clients. He grinned. Just because I pretend to be easy doesn't mean I don't work. It's just that I get it right the first time, and I don't need to stay here to fix mistakes. No, you're staying here to entertain your secretary. He threw me an amused look that said, Oh, great. Then he sat down in the chair in front of my desk. Well, now she's not here and I am. What's the reason? I don't know, Terry. Why are you still here? He didn't answer anything. Instead, he stood up and stepped forward until we were within a few centimeters of each other. Stop, cat, stop! My conscience was pleading with me. But one step at a time, and we got down to it. As corny as it sounds, I didn't feel guilty until I drove home. At the office, I showered and tidied up. The executive bathrooms had showers, so that when I came out, no one would have guessed. My makeup was applied, my hair was styled, my clothes were tidy. I just felt different. Everything was different now. In the last 20 minutes, my perspective on my entire marriage had fundamentally changed. I wanted a divorce. I loved Brandon. I loved him so much. But I couldn't be married to him anymore. Being his wife was sucking more out of my life than I was putting into it. That night was the final nail in the coffin. The fact that I was having fun with another man was proof that I didn't want to be in this marriage. When I got home, I found him in the living room. He was sitting on the couch with his laptop on his lap. There was a documentary on TV about the fall of the Roman Empire. Hi, kitty cat, he said when he saw me walk in. There's still some Chinese food in the fridge if you're hungry. I brought you some general cow and lo mein chicken. And I, I walked past him and sat on the chair instead of the couch with him. Seeing my face, he realized something was wrong. What's wrong, cat? He asked, his face showing worry in the creases on his forehead. I took a deep breath as a single tear rolled down my face. Bran, we need to talk. Dr. Carter, present tense. 
Wow, you told him everything? Just like that? I asked, genuinely surprised. Just like that, she repeated. I even told him about the pictures Terry sent. Wow, was all I could say. Most people usually only confess when they need to. They usually refrain until they're caught or about to be caught. And how did he react? Got angry. Lost his temper. He yelled, screamed, called me all sorts of words. Funny thing is, it was the first time he really showed that side of him. And you? What do you think I did? I yelled back, of course. I called him. What? A wimp, she said quickly. You said that? To his face? I asked in bewilderment. She nodded sadly. I know. I'm a bitch. You can say it. I wasn't going to say it, but Brandon can definitely make that argument. I joked. That elicited a half-smile from her. Oh, he did make that argument. Very loudly. It's still ringing in my ears. So, where are we at? What happened next? Cat, three years ago. The room seemed so familiar that I had to remind myself that I wasn't here for work. I was here to finalize my divorce. For months after my confession, Brandon and I lived like two ghosts. We were physically in the same house, but we couldn't really see or touch each other. I would come home from work, and the only evidence of his presence was the empty food containers in the trash. We might not see each other for a week. We never talked about how we were going to sleep, so I took the initiative and moved into the guest bedroom. I felt it was the right thing to do after all. I was the one who cheated. He didn't make a single argument against it. Moreover, he didn't say a word to me at all. The next time we spoke privately was when Mike, my attorney, gave me the divorce papers to hand to Brandon. I could have handed them to him while I was at work, but I felt I should do him the courtesy of giving him the papers myself. So I decided to leave early and drove home. I wanted to make sure I caught Brandon off guard. I had a suspicion that he was running to the bedroom to hide when he sensed I would be back soon to avoid me. I returned home a full four hours earlier than the appointed time. Once again, I found him in the living room. He wasn't fast enough to disappear from me. Again, like deja vu, I sat down in the chair. I tossed the papers on the coffee table in front of me. Is that what I think it is? He asked, not even lifting his eyes from the screen. All I could manage to mumble was a yes. He tried to look neutral and nonchalant, but I could see the resentment on his face for a moment. Then, without another word, he picked up the envelope, pulled out the papers, and silently read them. I felt a little embarrassed that I was just sitting there while he read, so I started to get up and leave him. Before I reached the door, he said, No, take them back. What? I asked. Take them back. I'm not signing them. He repeated, putting them back on the coffee table. I was at a loss. I don't know what reaction I was expecting, but this was not what I expected. This arrangement was more than fair. He was keeping his BMW, which was paid for. He stayed on my health insurance until he got his own. I even paid him alimony. A lot of alimony. It was enough to allow him to pursue his paltry dream and still live a relatively secure life. What more could he want? What do all abusive spouses want? It's never about money. It's usually about making the other person suffer. I didn't want to fight him in court. I really didn't. Not because I was afraid of losing. Quite the opposite. It was because I'd win. And crush him in the process. Bran, please. Don't make this any more painful than it has to be. I know I hurt you and I'm sorry. But trust me, you don't want to take this to court. That's why I set your alimony so high. If you go to court, the judge will give you a lot less than you're getting now. For the first time, he turned to look at me. His eyes were filled with angry tears. Hate lurked behind them. You'd think this was about money, he grinned. No, it's not about your money. I'm not signing this because I want you to draw up a new document. In this document, I don't want you to give me anything. Huh? I don't want anything from you. No alimony, no car, no insurance, nothing, he said with disgust in his voice. 
I want to pretend you never came into my life. I want it to be like I never met you. But how will you live? Not your problem. You've already signed me up as a useless husband you have to support. Change the document and I'll sign it. After that, I promise you will never have to endure attachment to me again. Bran, think about what you're saying, I pleaded with him. Most people would have jumped up and run out of the room before he changed his mind. But I didn't. After everything we'd been through, I didn't want him to starve to death because of wounded pride. Katrina, get out of my sight, he said nonchalantly, returning his attention to the computer in front of him. All I could do was pick up the paperwork and head to my room. Now we were here to finalize things. No matter how much the lawyer pleaded with Brandon, he wouldn't give in. I tried several times to convince him of the logic, but was met with venomous anger at every turn. In the end, I gave in. So be it. If he doesn't want my money, I'm not going to keep begging him to take it. I signed my part of the paperwork. My lawyer then moved the papers across the table to his side. Brandon and his lawyer whispered for a few seconds, and then the lawyer shook his head and handed Bran a pen. Bran was about to sign, but something made him stop. His pen hovered over the paper as if in indecision. Then he looked up at me. When our eyes met, I saw the man I had fallen in love with all those years ago, the man I thought I would grow old with. I loved you, Cat. I really did, he said sadly. Tears ran down my cheeks as I looked at him. His eyes clouded over as well. We sat like that, with a chasm of regret between us. Then, shaking his head dejectedly, he scribbled his name in the appropriate places. Without another word, he stood up and quickly left the room. Dr. Carter present tense. Kat couldn't hold back her tears by the end of her story. It was hard for me to remain impassive. I felt Kat's pain as she relived the regrets of that time in her life. I even felt Brandon's pain, even though he wasn't here to tell his side of the story. I couldn't imagine what it was like to be rejected by a spouse who didn't think you were good enough. How long have you been divorced? I asked. She snorted and wiped her nose with the other napkin I'd given her when she was in the middle of her story. Three years. That seems like a long time. Is this the first time you've grieved the end of your marriage? Not really. After it was consummated, I took two weeks off. I took a cruise to the Bahamas to get away from home. Even with Bran's things gone, there were traces of his presence everywhere. The bedroom bathroom still had his body wash. The pillows still smelled of his aftershave. The food he enjoyed was still in the refrigerator. I didn't have the presence of mind to completely rid the house of him, so I left and paid the maid extra to do it while I was gone. Was the cruise fun? It was fun at times. I drank a lot. I was entertained a couple times by some guy. He was at least six or seven years younger than me. He was a good distraction, I'll admit that to him. He had a lot of stamina. I also went to a few clubs, ate exotic food at restaurants, and bought a bunch of stuff I didn't need at all. But when I got back to my room, all I could think about was my marriage. How did you feel when you went back to work? She laughed out loud. While I was away, it was announced that Terry was the new senior partner. So I came back to this pleasant surprise. Ironic, isn't it? Indeed. It must have been a blow, considering everything that's happened. She snorted angrily. It was. It really was. That's why I quit. Wait, what? You quit? I asked, unable to hide the surprise in my voice. She laughed again. Yes, quit my job. Maybe I was still grieving my marriage and couldn't think clearly. I don't know. I was very emotional. But when I heard the news, I just lost my temper. Jerry Maguire style. When I left, I caused quite a stir. They're probably still talking about it to this day. Wow. That was all I could say. I hadn't expected that part of the story. Do you regret it? About what? Quitting your job or divorcing Bran? Both. She thought for a second before saying, Yes, I regret it. So what brings you here after all this time? I expected it to be sooner. She reached into her purse, which she had placed beside her on the couch, 
and pulled out a crumpled, tattered piece of paper that looked like a brochure. She placed it on the coffee table between us. I picked it up and read it. It was the program for a play called The Woman in the Cave. What's this? I asked. She snatched it out of my hands, unfolded it on the back, and pointed to the name. She pointed to the author. It was Brandon's play. She leaned back and told me about it. It's about a man who is trapped in a cave during a storm. He's trapped in there with a woman. While the storm rages outside, he and the woman talk to pass the time. He tells her stories from his life. Unfortunately, she's a real mean bitch. She constantly tells him everything that is wrong with every story he tells. She calls him weak and pathetic and chides him every chance she gets. At first, he gets mad at her. They yell and argue. Then he begins to believe he is worthless. Finally, near the end, he begins to realize how much potential he has. He realizes that this woman's only goal is to destroy him. When he finally confronts her and tells her that no matter what she says, he will no longer believe her, she disappears and the storm subsides. Then he realizes she was a figment of his imagination. Wow. That was all I could say, for what seemed like the billionth time today. He's playing for a week, then he's taking it to another city. Most critics have given the play rave reviews. There are even rumors that he already has another one ready. Reading the program, I looked up to see where the play was taking place. You do realize it's two hours away, right? Yes, I know. I understand. I take it you've already been there to see it. She nodded. How many times? Three. Every time I cry. Really? Why? She wiped the moisture from her cheeks. I don't know. I guess I hate to think about what I did to him. When I see the woman in the cave breaking the main character at every turn, it just makes me cringe. If that's how Bran sees me, I must have been a real monster. Do you ever see him in there? Every time. And you never go up to him and talk to him? No. I hide and just watch him after the play is over. I tell myself I'll go up to him and talk to him. I say that every time. But then I get nervous. What would you say to him if you had the courage? I don't know. I'd probably apologize. If the woman in that play is a carbon copy of me, I must have been awful to live with. I want him to know that I never meant to hurt him. I was angry and disappointed in him, but I loved him. At least until the very end. I just wanted him to do something with his life. But it was never my intention to humiliate him. You still consider him, what you called him, a bloody wimp? No. My husband was one. My ex-husband wasn't. I understand now why he didn't want anything from me in the divorce. He wasn't just trying to prove to me that he could get by without me. He was making his own way. He was making his own way. I just wish I'd been there to help him instead of holding him back. Maybe you did help him. Again? Maybe being married to you helped him. He didn't have the desperation that drives artists. Many great works of art and literature have come about during times of emotional upheaval. Look at all the great works of people who survived the Holocaust, slavery, or the Great Depression. Living in your home and eating your food, you didn't experience the desperation to produce that spark. Perhaps the collapse of your marriage gave him what he needed to find himself. But I'm a cave girl. Perhaps, I agreed with her. But the cave girl helped the man find himself, didn't she? She looked at me with a contorted face. So what are you saying? Are you saying he should thank me? No, Cat. Absolutely not. But I think you should try to talk to him and say whatever you need to say. And then you should forgive yourself. I paused to observe her. She was sniffling into the tissues left over from her previous bouts of crying. I continued. That's why you're here, isn't it? Because you haven't forgiven yourself. All that anger you feel about him being a wimp just crowds out your real focus. He was never a wuss. He was just unmotivated. You're angry because you weren't the one who motivated him. Not before you broke his heart. Yes, she said in a breaking voice, breaking into more sobs. I was his wife. I was supposed to be there for him. 
we were supposed to celebrate together. Well, then I think you know what you need to do when you see this play for the fourth time. It sounds like you have a lot to say to him. But what if he doesn't want to see me? What if he rejects me? Considering the fact that you've been rejecting him for almost a year, I think you can handle a little karma. A big, bad lawyer like you. She laughed curtly. I think so, Dr. Carter. We both stood up, and I let her hug me. You're going to be okay, Kat, I whispered in her ear, stroking her back reassuringly. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. Cat, next night. For the fourth time this week, I listened to the thunderous applause the actors applauded. For the fourth time, the actors called my ex-husband to the stage to bow with them. And for the fourth time, I cried. When everything quieted down and people began to go home, I stood in the corner and watched him interact with the guests in the audience. Every fiber of my being wanted to turn around and run back to the car. But my heart demanded that I stay. I needed to talk to him. When the crowd dispersed, I headed toward him. He noticed me when I was a few steps away, and I saw his smile fade. His eyes were trying to comprehend what he was seeing. Hey, Bran, I said meekly. I didn't mean it to sound that way. It just sounded that way. Cat? Hi. Didn't expect to see you. Yeah, but I was in town and thought I'd check out your theater. I've heard great things about it. Confused, he asked. Really? You were in town? All the way here? My brain weakly tried to come up with a plausible scenario where I would end up so far from home. When no option came to mind, I decided to humble myself and just tell the truth. Actually, no. I'm lying. The only reason I'm in town is to see you just like I was here last night and the night before. He froze in place. You're here to see me? He asked incredulously. Why? I took a deep breath. This conversation was actually shaping up better than I thought it would. I hadn't expected it to go this far. I had a bunch of scenarios running through my head. One of them even ended with him forcibly grabbing me and throwing me out. I need to tell you something especially now after watching you play. I was hoping we could go out and, you know, talk for a while. My voice sounded nervous and unsure. It was so uncharacteristic of me that it made him wary. He looked at me as if he was trying to figure out the complex equation written on my brow. I wanted him to see that I was calm here, so I added, Please, Bran, I won't take up too much of your time. He decided to take my words at face value. All right, then. Yeah. Let me tell Peyton where I'm going, and then we can grab a bite to eat. Okay. I'll wait over there, I said, pointing to my seat. He nodded and walked away. I sat back down in my seat and watched his short conversation with a petite woman holding a clipboard. She looked something like Hermione from Harry Potter, only with glasses. I saw her glance in my direction a couple times as they talked. They seemed to be comfortable with each other. The way they interacted seemed familiar and at ease. I realized how comfortable they were when they kissed before he walked over to me. All right, Cat, I'm ready to go, he said, putting on his coat and scarf. And then I got up from my chair and followed him out of the theater. So what brings you here? He asked, swallowing a bite of his disgusting roast beef sandwich. I stabbed my salad with my fork, watching him. I'd rehearsed this moment so many times, like I was preparing a deposition on the eve of an important case. I knew what I had to say, but right now, nothing. An empty space. I just wanted to say, I'm sorry. It was all I could say. He nodded and sighed, averting his gaze. Silence fell between us. Neither of us knew where to take this conversation. There were so many unspoken words between us, so much unspoken pain. It was impossible to know where to begin. You hurt me, Cat, he finally said. Simple. Everything we were trying to say to each other fit into those four words. I know. I look back and... I... I... I said, unable to hold back the tears that were starting to come to my eyes. Bran looked at me and nodded. Yeah, 
Me too. There was silence around us again. Once again, Brandon got behind the wheel. What did you think of my play? He asked, changing a mood that was threatening to turn somber. My face lit up. Oh my God, I really like it. Honestly, I didn't know you had it in you. And then I didn't mean for that last statement to sound the way it did. It was supposed to be a compliment. But instead, it sounded like I didn't believe it at all. I meant that I didn't know you wrote plays. I thought you only wrote novels. I said this, quickly trying to clean myself up. I sat there hoping he would buy it instead of focusing on my Freudian slip. Well, a wise man once told me that if I'm doing the best I can and publishers still turn me down, then maybe I should try something else. There was humor in his voice. He even smiled. I breathed a sigh of relief. Looks like this wise man is smart. Probably went to Stanford. I joked back. And then a cloud came over me as I added, even if she was a bitch. We both sat in awkward silence again. He wasn't going to dispute the fact that I was a bitch, nor did I expect him to. But I secretly hoped he would. Bran, am I the woman in the cave? I asked, after the silence got weird. I wasn't sure I wanted him to confirm it, but I needed to know. He nodded. Yeah, well, partly. When I first started writing the play, she was you. But as I was finishing it, an epiphany came over me. I realized that a lot of what you were saying was what I thought of myself. I mean, I didn't think I was weak, but I was unmotivated. I inwardly shuddered when he said that last sentence, but he didn't notice it. He just kept talking. I was content to sit around and wait for someone to knock on my door and provide me with a golden opportunity. It wasn't until we got divorced that I was able to have an epiphany, after going through all that rage, of course. It was like I was surrounded by you and your stuff, and I couldn't see myself. Does that make sense? I nodded. Yeah, I get it. My biggest regret is that I didn't find a way to motivate you without being such a bitch. I just saw so much potential in you. I felt like you were wasting it, and I resented that. And then the Terry thing happened. Anger flashed across his face. Yeah, I definitely could have done without that. I know. You didn't deserve that. I wish I could go back and do it all over again. He didn't say anything back, and we fell into silence again. I fought my thoughts to get us out of this quagmire. I didn't want to reopen old wounds. So, who was that girl you were talking to? Is there a new Mrs. Kerrigan in the life of the handsome young playwright? I asked, trying to lighten the mood. No, not yet, but soon there will be, he said with a boyish smile. Soon? I interjected. He nodded. Yes, her name is Peyton. I met her at a local coffee shop. It operates as a poetry lounge. I found it by accident one day, and I've been going there ever since. It's become my sanctuary. Listening to people express themselves through writing helped me when I was at rock bottom. I'm so sorry, Bran, I repeated, for what seemed like the billionth time. Guilt swept over me again. He waved his hand dismissively. Water under the bridge. Besides, that's how I met Payday. Payday? I asked incredulously. He laughed. You call her Payday? You're kidding, right? He shook his head and took a sip of his drink. I covered my eyes with my hand like I was embarrassed and asked, What is it with you and these corny nicknames? His mouth dropped open, and he mockingly pretended to be offended. Whatever, don't pretend you didn't like Kitty Cat. I made a grimace, as if I smelled something wrong, and shook my head. That caused another fit of laughter on his part. You're a liar. We started making noise and people started looking at our table, so we calmed down. When we were able to act like adults again, he said, Payday was the one who suggested I write plays. Really? He took another sip of soda and continued. Yes. When I showed her all the books I'd written, she didn't praise me too much. It would be more correct to say brutally honest with the emphasis on brutal. Well, we both know how much you love brutally honest women, I joked. Maybe I'm a masochist, he said with a laugh. On the other hand, she gave me some good notes. 
She said the reason they didn't work out was because there was too much dialogue and not enough context. The format is more for actors and actresses. That lit a light bulb in my head, and six months later I had my first play. The Woman in the Cave? Hell no. My first play sucked. Peyton told me so with a candor that almost rivaled. What did you call me? A wimp? Once again, an embarrassed, apologetic expression came over my face. But along with the criticism, she gave a lot of good comments and encouragement. About a year after that, I had a play. She read it, thought it was great, and helped me stage it. She even acted as director. Now people everywhere are asking to stage it. Wow, that's great, Bran, said I with admiration. Sincerely. Truthfully, I felt a sense of jealousy hearing how she helped him realize his dream in a way I couldn't. She really motivated him, believing in him to the point where she made it her mission to help him succeed. She didn't just tell him the mistakes in his dream, she showed him how to fix them. As I drove here, I didn't know what to expect from our conversation. Some part of me was hoping he wasn't dating anyone. I was a little disappointed when I found out. But at the same time, a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. It was nice to see him happy. There was something about him that was different from when we were married. The swagger that comes out of a man when he knows he's doing something he's good at. He was the Brandon I knew he could be. Peyton sounds wonderful, I said, taking his hand that was resting on the table. Thank you, Kat. That means a lot. When I finally pulled my hand away, he asked, What about you? How are you doing? Is there anyone special? I shook my head. No, nothing special, but I quit my job at the firm. What? Why? It's a long story. Long story short, I was promoted to senior partner. He shook his head. Damn, Cat, I know how hard you worked on that. Well, I think they lost big time on this one, he said. I honestly believed he was being sincere. Yeah, stuff happens, you know. But I quickly found a job at another firm. I took a slight pay cut, but it was almost unnoticeable since my ex-husband was a stubborn jerk who refused to pay child support. You're welcome, he joked smugly. Never mind. Anyway, right now I'm really focused on my career. There's a lot more potential for growth where I am, and I intend to pursue it. That doesn't leave much room for relationships. If Mr. Wright shows up, then fine. If he's happy to defer to my goals, we can try. But I'm not on a quest. I'm fine where I am. I said this with a smile. Nah. He nodded and looked at me in a way that made me realize he was genuinely happy for me. Good. We talked for another couple of hours. We talked about everything. He talked about the new people in his life. I talked about a few cases I was working on. Like I said, he was a very good conversationalist. I was disappointed when it was over. I didn't want to leave him. If I'm being honest with myself, a big part of me missed him and what he brought to my life. This Brandon and I definitely could have done better. But he was happy in the new life he had found. It suited him just fine, and I was happy for him. As I drove home, I felt better than I had in a long time. I knew that Brandon had forgiven me, and that really helped me forgive myself. I may have been his girlfriend in the cave, but it wasn't the end for both of us. A person who lives life to the fullest, learns from the past, lives in the present, and plans for the future. What more could you ask for? Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.